Hi everyone, this is lesson 44. Today we're going to be talking about the commands of Maundy Thursday evening, and we're going to talk about what exactly that word Maundy means here uh, in just a little bit. We're on page 166. I'll read the introduction at the top. We now look at the final hours of Jesus' life. Jesus' passion, which means his suffering, was a tumultuous time for him and for those around him. Yet this tumult was not without purpose. Jesus endured all of these pains and problems in order to accomplish what God had promised so long before. Jesus was fulfilling the promise to save us all, the entire world, from our sins. So let's uh, read about what takes place on Maundy Thursday. Uh, we'll be reading John chapter 13, verses 1 through 38, uh, where we see Jesus' first uh, command that night. Uh, Jesus' first command of the evening was that his disciples and the members of his church show one another the kind of love that he had shown to them. So please pause and read John 13, 1 through 38. All right, let's look at the questions. Number one, we're told that Jesus loved his disciples to the very end. On this night, what special and unique way did Jesus show that love? So we're told, and it depends what translation you're using at home, that Jesus loved his disciples to the very end, to the very last, uh, to the utmost. Uh, what way did Jesus show uh, that love to his disciples? He uh, got down on his hands and knees, uh, grabbed a basin of water and a rag, and he uh, washed his disciples' feet. Number two, why did Peter resist having Jesus wash his feet? Why did Peter uh, resist and say, no, Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet? Uh, well, it just didn't seem right for Jesus, the promised Savior, the Son of God, uh, to uh, be doing the work of a lowly servant. Usually this was uh, a servant's job uh, to wash the feet of people gathering for a meal. And this is maybe something that seems a little bit strange to us, just this whole foot washing thing. Um, but this was something that was uh, necessary back then uh, when uh, basically you walked everywhere uh, in sandals on dirt roads. Uh, your feet would get pretty grimy, pretty dirty, pretty disgusting by the end of the day. And so uh, when it was time for the evening meal, uh, normally um, you would have a, a servant if uh, you were... Um, in a position to, to have a servant, uh, you would have a servant wash your feet and the feet of your guests uh, for the meal. Um, and here Jesus is taking the place of a servant. He is doing this uh, disgusting uh, job of washing the grime and sweat and dirt uh, off of his disciples' feet. And Peter says, this just isn't, isn't right. Number three, why was this such a special and unexpected expression of love? All 
Why was this such a special and unexpe uh, unexpected expression of love? Uh, here Jesus uh, humbles himself. Uh, he serves his disciples in love. Uh, it's important to, uh, to remember that uh, Jesus' disciples were uh, arguing about which one of them was the greatest, which one of them was the most important. Uh, and that makes sense as they're getting together for this special Passover uh, meal. Uh, the, the most important guest, the most honored guest, would sit at the right hand of the host. So if Jesus is the host, they're arguing about who gets to sit at his right hand, which one of us is the most important. And here Jesus does the opposite. Uh, rather than talking about how uh, important he is, uh, he gets down uh, on his hands and knees, wipes the grime off their feet. He humbles himself, shows them what love is all about. Uh, it's about humble service. Number four, what were the disciples supposed to learn from this? What were the disciples supposed to learn from this? Uh, they were supposed to learn from Jesus' example uh, that they should love and serve each other in humility, that it's not about um, me, my rights, my prestige, uh, my honor, or anything like that. Uh, it's about humbly loving and serving each other. Number five, the term Mondi in Mondi Thursday comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means command or direction. On this evening, Jesus gave his disciples two commands. What was the first command in verse 34? What was the first command that Jesus uh, gave? Uh, he tells his disciples, he tells us, love one another. And again, when he talks about loving one another, he's talking about this, this humble, self-sacrificing service. Number six, what does it mean to truly love someone else? Uh, you can read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, Romans 5, 6 uh, through 8. Uh, when the Bible talks about uh, loving someone, what, what does that really mean? What does it mean uh, for us as Christians to show love? Uh, it means being willing to sacrifice yourself, uh, your uh, wants, your time, your pleasure, maybe even your own life, in order to do what is best for that other person. Um, sometimes, you know, especially when you watch TV shows or movies or, or whatever it is, um, and, and you hear about love, love very often is portrayed as a feeling uh, that you that you have for someone else, uh, but really, when the Bible talks about love, love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotion. Love is a commitment to take action, to do what is best for someone, not necessarily what what someone wants, but doing what is best for someone. Being willing to sacrifice yourself uh, for the good of someone else. Uh, that, that really is what love is all about, and we see that here with Jesus. Jesus is willing to sacrifice himself uh, for the good of his disciples. Number seven, how had Jesus shown his disciples this kind of love by washing their feet?
how did Jesus show this kind of love? He sacrificed uh, his time. Uh, Jesus has only hours left in this world before his suffering and death. Um, and he is, is taking the time uh, to serve others. He's sacrificing his dignity, um, doing the lowly work of a servant. Uh, he is, is sacrificing all of these things, and he's about to sacrifice uh, his own life uh, for the good of, of his people. Number eight, how does showing love for another demonstrate that we are Jesus' disciples? How does showing love uh, demonstrate that we are Jesus' disciples? Well, we uh, reflect the love of Jesus in our lives. When we show this sort of humble, self-sacrificing love toward others, uh, really people are getting a glimpse at the love of Jesus. Uh, or vice versa, when we fail to show this sort of love, uh, then people are, are not seeing the love of Jesus. Maybe they're being turned off. Um, because uh, they, uh, they know that we are Christians and yet we don't show love. Maybe they figure, well, Jesus must not be very loving either. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, as we are filled with the love of Jesus in our lives, that love overflows from our hearts, shows itself in our words and in our actions, um, so that people are able to, to see and appreciate the love of Jesus. Number nine, Peter boldly promised that he would be willing to lay down his life for Jesus. What startling revelation did Jesus make about Peter, though? What revelation did Jesus make about Peter? Uh, Peter was about to deny that he even knew Jesus. Uh, so um, Peter obviously is going to uh, to fail to show love and uh, dedication, a willingness to sacrifice himself um, when, when he denies that he even knows Jesus. Uh, but Jesus, even after Peter denies him, Jesus, once again, shows humble love in forgiving Peter for his failure. Okay, let's go then to Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. The second command that Jesus gives to take, eat, and drink. Uh, his second command of the evening, uh, he gave his disciples and his church an intimate way to remember his suffering and death while receiving the forgiveness of sins. So please pause and read Luke 22, 14 through 20. Let's go to the questions. Number 10, Jesus and his disciples were celebrating the Passover meal. What event did the Passover meal commemorate? Review lesson 13, if you're not sure. So the Passover uh, commemorated and celebrated how God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. Uh, so we, uh, we talked about this in Lesson 13. Uh, God had uh, his people, the Israelites, um, put the, the blood of a lamb on their, their door frame, uh, eat the lamb as part of a special meal along with unleavened bread and some other things. And that very night... Um, uh, God went through, killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, uh, rescued the people. The people were set free from their slavery in Egypt. And so this was a lasting celebration. Um, every year, 
God's people would get together to celebrate the Passover, to eat um, a lamb and uh, the unleavened bread that was part of the meal, drink wine, uh, and so on. And 11, as Jesus gave his disciples the bread to eat, what did he say about the bread? So Jesus and his disciples are celebrating uh, the Passover, and uh, as we said, uh, part of the Passover meal was unleavened bread. Jesus takes the bread and he gives it to his disciples and he says, take and eat, this is my body. Number 12, likewise, he took the cup of wine and gave it to his disciples. Uh, compare verse 20 with Matthew 26, gives us um, another account of the same thing. What does Jesus say? What did Jesus say about the wine? Jesus gives them uh, a cup filled with wine, and he says, take and drink, this is my blood. Number 13, what special gift did Jesus say they received through uh, this wine, which is his blood? So Jesus says, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Number 14, review the first, second, and third parts of the Lord's Supper from Luther's small catechism. Those are printed for you on page 168. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, otherwise known as Holy Communion, how is it possible that we receive not only bread and wine, but Jesus' actual body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. You might want to pause and, and just read through those very important sections of the Catechism there. So Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood. And uh, some Christians, some Christian churches and groups, uh, they read that and they say, well, obviously that can't, that can't actually be the case, that can't actually be true. Uh, this must be just a symbol of Jesus' body and blood, a, a reminder of Jesus' body and blood, but uh, but that, that isn't what Jesus says, right? Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. How can that, how can that be? Uh, well, as we say in the Catechism, um, Jesus says, uh, this is my body, this is uh, my blood. And so we trust those words. Um, and we say that this is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine. Um, if Jesus says that we receive his body and blood for our forgiveness, then we trust uh, that we do receive his body and blood for our forgiveness. We know that Jesus is all powerful. Uh, we know that Jesus can do miracles. And so we trust that in a miraculous way, a way that we can't fully understand, um, when we eat the bread and drink the wine, we are also um, receiving Jesus' body and blood. That this is not just a reminder, this is not just a symbol, uh, but this really is 
Uh, the bread really is Jesus' body. The wine really is uh, Jesus' blood. Even if we can't fully understand this or explain how it can be, uh, we believe that it is, is true. Number 15, the Lord's Supper is not a free-for-all. God attached some serious warnings to this supper. Read 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30. Uh, what needs to be true before we partake of the Lord's Supper? So what needs to be true before someone partakes of the Lord's Supper? Well, uh, we need to recognize that we are sinners who need forgiveness. Uh, we need to recognize that Jesus' body and blood are really present. Um, and, and this is why we have classes like this, uh, why we will study the, the Catechism in even more depth uh, next year. Um, in preparation for examination and confirmation. This is why uh, we don't invite everyone who comes to church um, on, on a Sunday to come up and receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is a very uh, important, a very powerful thing. And because we recognize that this is a powerful medicine, we want to make sure that people understand what exactly it is uh, before they take it. Just like uh, a pharmacist doesn't uh, hand out medicine to whoever happens to come to the pharmacy that day. Um, the pharmacist needs to make sure before they hand out powerful medicine that the person receiving it knows what it is, understands what it is, and how to use it, and so on. Um, and, and so that's why we practice what is called closed communion. This is um, what the church has always done throughout its history, really it's only uh, in very recent times that churches have distributed Holy Communion to everyone. And that's because they don't think that it actually is Jesus' body and blood. They don't think that it actually gives forgiveness. You know, if it's just a reminder or a symbol, then who cares? Everyone can have it. But if this is really the body and blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, uh, then we need to make sure that people recognize that before they receive because, number 16, if we're not properly prepared for the Lord's Supper, uh, what does Paul warn that we are doing in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 30? Uh, if we're not properly prepared for the Lord's Supper, um, what warning is there? Uh, well, Paul warns that uh, if someone receives the Lord's Supper not recognizing what it is, then they are guilty of sinning against the body and blood of Jesus. They're bringing judgment uh, upon themselves. Um, in, in, again, in the same way that if someone takes some medicine without recognizing what it is, uh, they can do some serious damage to their bodies. Uh, here, Paul says, if you take Holy Communion without recognizing what it is, uh, you can do some serious damage uh, to uh, your soul. Number 17, review the fourth part of the Lord's Supper from Luther's small catechism. That's printed on page 169. Uh, what does he say that we should have before partaking of the Lord's Supper? All right, so this is something that the Catechism uh, directly addresses. Uh, who is properly prepared to receive the sacrament? The first three parts of Holy Communion in the Catechism talk about just what a powerful medicine is. And then the fourth question is, um, who's prepared to receive it? And the answer is, 
uh, those who have faith in God's promises. He is properly prepared who believes these words, who has faith in these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. And number 18, based on what we've seen about the Lord's Supper in Scripture, what makes the celebration of the Lord's Supper such an important part of a Christian's life? Why is the Lord's Supper so important? Uh, well, because, uh, like baptism, it's a, a beautiful way, uh, a sacrament, in which God gives us forgiveness in a powerful, tangible way. Tangible means you can touch it, you can see it, you can taste it, right? Um, and so just think about how amazing this is, uh, that every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, uh, Jesus' body and blood are truly, really miraculously present there uh, in, with, and under the bread and the wine that we get to receive Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of all of our sins in a very real way. We get to touch and taste forgiveness. What, what does forgiveness uh, look like? What does forgiveness taste like? Well, well, we can answer that because um, we are, are enabled to participate in this. You know, once, once you're confirmed, you'll be able to participate in this miracle. And, and it is a miracle. Sometimes people say, boy, I wish, we could, I wish we could experience miracles like the people back in Bible times did. Uh, but we do. We, we get to witness and even participate in this miracle every Sunday if we want to. Um, when uh, Jesus' body and blood are, are miraculously present, um, along with the bread and the wine, where we get to, to eat and drink the forgiveness of, of all of our sins, it's an amazing, amazing thing. Okay, the key questions then for this lesson. A, how do we show our love to one another? We serve them in humility putting their needs above our own. And B, what blessings do we receive in the Lord's Supper? We receive the forgiveness of sins, and then along with forgiveness comes eternal life and salvation. This is a meal that gives us eternal life. That's, uh, again, that's just amazing. And C, why do we want to be properly prepared to receive the Lord's Supper? So that we receive it as this amazing blessing and not as a judgment, not as something that's going to harm us. Okay, uh, homework for next time. Please work on memorizing uh, all of those parts of Holy Communion, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Um, I know that's a lot, and I know you're not going to necessarily get it down perfectly. Um, but please work on memorizing that, because you will be, be memorizing it uh, for, for next year. Um, be able to answer the key questions for this lesson, Lesson 44. And please read pages 350 to 373 in the Catechism, um, where uh, the, the wonderful, amazing blessings of Holy Communion are laid out in more detail for you there. All right, that'll do it for this lesson. Have a wonderful day, and God's blessings to all of you.